Okay, so um, as you can see there, he was born in uh, 1947 in that high period of uh, Negro consciousness. I know it well because I come from that period too, from the 40s and the 50s. Uh, when we uh, wanted to uh, try to uh, show that we were equal and that we were competent and that we could do everything that the oppressors could do. And in doing that showing, we pretty much uh, copied them. Um, it's kind of like uh, what um, uh, Franklin, uh, e. Franklin Frazier talks about uh, the, um, the masquerade, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the um, ongoing partying. That's when we were doing the paper bag tests and uh, all of those kind of things uh, to, and then, you know, show in real uptight uh, because we were uh, in the Negro period. But anyway, this is where, uh, where uh, Lomax comes out of. He has been uh, the president of, uh, uh, of uh, many universities, uh, traditional black universities. Uh, he was the uh, president of Dillard, he has taught at Morehouse, and uh, so on. Uh, but the thing that, is, that uh, takes me to what I want to talk about is the fact that the Koch brothers, mm. and I'm sure mm. all of you know the Koch brothers, yeah. those yeah. infamous brothers who are rolling back all of the gains that we achieved during the 1960s, during the Civil Rights and Black Power Movement. Mm -hmm. The Koch brothers, uh, approached Michael Lomax mm -hmm. and uh, offered him $25 million as a gift. Uh -huh. uh, and Lomax accepted it. Okay, so uh, which means that the Koch brothers now have him in their pocket. Okay, which means that a person like me, uh, uh, Brother Greg, or uh, uh, Brother Manu, people like that, radical people, will not be able to teach at those colleges. Uh -oh. <laughs> They're going to teach something that opposes what the Koch brothers want. And for anything that has to do with our uh, being is in opposition to the Koch brothers. I so um, I wanted to present this because uh, I think we need to know who's in charge uh, when we put people in charge. And I, I, I also wanted to talk about, and I know brother is a, a timing me over here. Okay, got me on the timer. So um, I want to say that um, it's important for us to know who's at the helm. And uh, I, um, so, and also this brother, uh, Brother Lomax, he serves on the board of Teach for America, the KIPP Foundation, the National Alliance, Alliance for Public Charter Schools, and Stand Up from Children. All of these organizations have activated the privatization of public schools throughout the nation and effectively cut black parents and black communities um, out of participation in black children's education. This was uh, this whole uh, um, insight was gained from the work that I did in New Orleans looking at the privatization of schools there. But uh, the other thing is uh, this is where the middle class, and that's why I started with uh, people from that era. This is where they're going now. Jesse Jackson uh, just uh, attempted to initiate some kind of operation of making a deal with Silicon Valley when they reported that there's less than 1% of blacks involved in that technology in that area. And so he wants to make one, a broker one of those 1960 deals. Well, you know what that means. The broker goes in and takes the skim off the top, and then a few black people get to go into the to the jobs. So one of the, the what I I want to ask in terms of this positioning is, um, are we going to continue the way that we did, you know, beginning in the high Negro period, when we wanted just a few of us to survive, a few of us to get, go through? Are we going to continue those strategies? And if we are not, what are we going to do about it? Because um, the African-American community, some people who 
heard about Lomax's deal with the Koch brothers said that uh, uh, $25 million is nothing to sneeze at, okay? Uh, $25 million is a lot of money. Uh, other people say self-determination is nothing to sneeze at either. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Amos Wilson said we must evaluate education in terms of its fruits. We cannot continue to admire this system. We uh, ca uh, cannot continue to admire the people that made this system. We cannot continue to want to be equal with them. These people who are threatening to end our lives and our very survival on well earth. Said. Okay, the idea that we're going to create children who are going to make great contributions to America is not your salvation, said. Brother uh, Amos Wilson said. They will have to defend their lives. Education is a very serious affair for us. It goes beyond the everyday thing of equal opportunity. It is at the heart of our survival. Right. This is also the conclusion of Derrick Bell, who discovered this truth in seeing the outcome of his work in uh, desegregating public schools. And I conclude the following three questions. What profit is there in an education that situates people of African descent to gain shares in an amoral world in exchange for self-determination? How do we begin to value and develop a full scope of education and social life that does not replicate what Franklin Fraser refers to as the gaudy carnival and playing seriously. How do we begin to seriously consider and plan education for our children and a social life for ourselves aimed at a different thinking style, a different system of values, and a different approach to human relations to get us out of this quandary that we're in today? That's what Amos Wilson said, we're in a quandary and we have to deal with it. So we need to know um, who's at the helm. Yeah. We need to know what they believe in. That's right. And we need to stand up. That's right. Because $25 million is not going to take care of our children for generations and no. generations no. if somebody is in the pocket of somebody who wants to do the opposite. Yeah. So uh, this is what I think. Thank you. by someone who admittedly comes from the high Negro period. Uh, they're aware of how they are. Negroes who lost their lives in the struggle were liberation. I think we see them hanging from ropes and burned on the ground. People who call themselves and identify themselves as
And I was once called an eagle without knowing the implications of that as a child and answers to it. As I think to no fault of our own. Uh, and so these are rhetorical things. Right. They don't really they don't really conform with the reality of the theory. And what I heard were opportunists described. Opportunists. Okay. Yeah. People who exploit their education, their position in society, uh, as so called leaders of our people when what they're doing is lying in pocket. Mm -hmm. And every generation has those. What do we call the ones that exist today? We call themselves black. Liberated. So I think we need to be clear uh, that race and class uh, play dual roles in every generation. We need to identify the people who are doing that by what they're doing rather than by what how we refer to ourselves as people. Otherwise every generation will have this fun that I have right now. I think it's kind of hard to say. So uh, um, when they have money are the ones to whom faith gives fortune. But wealth goes to those who give food to others by means of it. The heart of God is satisfied with the poor standing provided for before him. Thus, if you acquire property, give a portion to God by giving a portion to the poor. If you acquire property, spend it on your town so that there will be no turmoil in it. If it is in your power, invite those far away as well as those near you. For those who invite those from afar, their name will be great when they go afar. For those who love their neighbors will find a family around them. God allows one to acquire wealth in return for doing good. And those who give food to the poor, God takes them to himself in mercy without measure. And so we give thanks to Ancestor Feed Four. Probably slaughtering the name Feed Four for those words. Uh, words that give us perspective. Uh, word that gives us a standard, that give us a reference as to how we should behave, how we should be operating in this, in this social structure. 
your thing, and more importantly, give praise to the spirit that created us. You say, I say. And we would not be here without that creative force and truth. There's something you have to wonder about. There's other things that aren't true. Our people have always believed in creation, and there was a time before even time was created that the way we thought about it was that even being itself had to come into being. And if there was some energy, some spirit, some intelligence before all that, it's beyond our comprehension. We can't define time. We have enough trouble keeping time. We can't define time. We have enough trouble being on time. We come up with all kinds of, you know, innovation, seeking time. <laughs> but it's a good God, a mighty God, a merciful God that we worship and praise and we say, I we give thanks to our ancestors who uh, did great work, sometimes made great mistakes, had their own debates about what to call themselves, yeah, what to yeah. call others, and we're part of that tradition. Yeah. Um, and as we strive to rethink ourselves constantly as Africans, uh, we don't throw away any of what is good about our history. We don't throw away anything Be that helps move us to step forward on the path of freedom, liberation, and justice. So this morning, uh, we give thanks for our ancestors, and we also appreciate our elders, yes. the people around us who, in our lives, continue to remind us of what is good, yes. even when their bodies begin to fail, even yes. when um, their minds, in our judgment, might not be as clear as they used to be. Yes. Their mom and daddy and grandma and them, y'all, grandma and them, yeah, I said, yes. they always got something <laughs> that's worthwhile. That's right. And it was a blessing yes. when um, we had a program for Eli Oma Day a couple of days ago, and Tanke and Brother Matalisi's mom um, came, Mother Dixie came, and she was here. It's the first time we had seen her in a while. And I asked how she was doing. She was fine. She was the same as she always been. I mean, her, the, she always been kind of chill. You know, all y'all kind of chill people. I, that's where y'all got it from. Right? And so it was a blessing to have her in the in yes, this space. Yes, and yes. so we give thanks for all of our elders, the elders who are in the room with us today. We thank yes. you for what you do, who you are. And we want to ask the elders for permission to continue because our tradition. And they say it's all right. We give all the elders around the world. So I want to. And I like what Brother Katabashi says, you know, just some words of encouragement. Yes. Because our uh, tradition requires us to study on our own, to meditate, to pray, to pay attention, to listen, to gain spiritual wisdom from every situation. Not just when you come here, but when you're moving around in the world, what's the wisdom, what's the spiritual teaching that is all over if we just pay attention? Yes. Ashe. So I want to use the theme today, what did you do with the day that God gave you? Mm. What did you do with the day that God gave you? Did you make a contribution to eternity? Mm. Did you complain about everything that happened mm. that day? Mm. Did you fuss a lot? Did you cuss a lot? Did you spit a lot? That's an old southern thing, cussing and spitting, yeah. <laughs> Tell a big lie. <laughs> Tell a big story. What did you do with the day that God gave you? We think about what you did yesterday. Was there anything in your day that if you were having an exit interview, like sometimes on your jobs they have exit right. interviews. Right. Like you may have had one at Berkeley. When you were last, they want to know what how was it for you? <laughs> and you had a chance to tell people what happened, right? right. Yeah. If you had an exit interview, with God, would you yeah. be able to say, well, today, yeah. here's what I did uh -huh. that served you. Yeah. Here's what I did that made life better for somebody. Yeah. Beyond the basic things you have to do to keep yourself going, eating, yeah. sleeping, you know, hygiene, keeping yourself clean, because those things take up a certain amount of time. Yeah. But in the rest of your time, what did you do with the day that God gave you? We have to acknowledge that little things become big things. Little things are important. I have to acknowledge and thank Mama and Gina for the beautiful flowers that always show up on the altar. Yes. Yes. It may seem like a little thing, but it's a big thing. 
And apparently somebody removed some flowers without her permission, and she got upset about it this morning and was fussing. <laughs> and she was, that's her right. You, where you at, Mom? Yeah, you get the fuss. That's right. Took, like, took the flowers, <laughs> but she replaced them, and it's beautiful again. Ashe. And we say, Ashe. Ashe. Thank you. Ashe. Thank you. Then, um, then Sister Mona, uh, when she went on her trip with the rest of the folks that went to Cuba, <laughs> she brought us some nice mar maracas. You know what they call them? Maracas. Maracas. She brought some nice maracas back, you know, you know, you know. and so it, it adds to our percussion. And so we, we invite you, if you have some percussion instruments sitting around your house, or uh, you go on a trip, you see some nice, bring it back. You know, basket is, what is that? Basket is hard to get full of stuff. It means everybody has some to use. So we thank you for that little bit yeah. that she did. It may seem like a small thing, but she thought about us. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I go, and I ask that question, what did you do with your, the day that God gave you? On that day, she brought something beautiful and useful for how we worship. We say thank you. Okay. Within that question, there's a couple of questions. How did you start your day with God? What morning ritual did you have? And I'm, I gotta, I'm preaching it myself. Don't, don't ever get twisted, think I'm not talking to myself, right? Because my morning ritual sometimes becomes jump up, drink some coffee, get a donut, call it breakfast. Get on the computer, have a phone call with somebody on the East Coast. Because a lot of times my day starts around 7.30, 8 o'clock, talking to people on the East Coast. You know. But that day shouldn't start like that. My day should start with meditation. My day should start with prayer. My day should start with going in my yard, maybe, and looking at what's going on with my tomatoes. You know. My day should start with something that's more grounded than coffee and donuts, I say. Now, I'm not going to ask you to report on how you started your day. <laughs> but all of us, just we get up and we hit the snooze button as many times as possible <laughs> until we got to go. And I don't leave room for that morning ritual. Yeah. It doesn't, unless you, I mean, you might be able to do that in your car, on the bus, on BART, while you're walking to work, whatever you're doing. But how did you start your day? Did you start your day with God? Now, see, this is one of the things I, I admire and appreciate my Muslim, uh, about my Muslim brothers and sisters. When you go to other parts of the world and you hear, Akbar, it'd be like dark in the morning. It'd still be dark. And they call calling people to prayer. You can't really avoid it. Right? The way it happens, you can't really avoid it. You might be Christian, Muslim, African traditionally, whatever you are, but you're going to still hear, Akbar. You're going to hear that prayer first thing in the morning. And it's a beautiful thing. And then another four times in, during the day, they call the people to prayer. Yes, yes. My, my um, Bifile brothers and sisters who are Sufi Muslims, they say, well, we don't pray five times a day. We pray all the time. Mm -hmm. Every word, every song, every speech, mm -hmm. we dedicate to God. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have that kind of daily ritual, it, it has an impact on you. Yes, yes, it does. You know, Brother yes. David shared his daily ritual with us, what he does in his personal altar. I mean, everybody needs a daily ritual. Yes, yes. And that's on you to create that ritual. You can take ideas from this tradition, you can take ideas from others, but whatever speaks to your heart about how you start your day, not with coffee, but with God. Not with tea, but with God. And those things, you know, you can ingest whatever, but is our mind on the most high? Because if the most high, we weren't on the most high's mind, maybe most high say, well, this week, they don't need air. So they on their own, they can figure it out. Hold your breath. Take little breaths. <laughs> if the sun doesn't come up, we're going to be concerned, Bobby. We're going to wonder, man, where the sun today? Especially when it's cold outside. But see, the Spirit keeps giving us on a regular basis, habitually, food, clothing, shelter, things that we should never take for granted. And then our question is, what is the reciprocity? What did you do that supported creation? What did you do? What was your contribution to God's work? I want to turn your attention to a passage that you find on page 94 of the Hosea. If you have a Hosea there with you, I'm going to ask you to pick up that Hosea and turn to page 94. There should be some out and around. Share one with your neighbor. Say, neighbor. <laughs> Say, neighbor. <laughs> I love you. And we're going to share some of our ancestors' words. It's passage number three on page 94. Everybody have it? Yeah. All right. We're going to read this. It comes from a scribe of the royal treasury and mayor of two towns. Now, you know, that's a busy brother. 
Tahiri was that scribe. And if you're the scribe of the royal treasury, it means you're essentially the accountant for the royal treasury, right? And the mayor, not of one town, but two towns. It'd be nice if we had a one mayor doing something <laughs> worthwhile. Sorry, I've been slamming on Gene all the time, sorry. But let's read this together. I am a noble who served his Lord, one skilled and free of negligence. I walked the road I had explored. I was guided by my own heart on the road of those who praised by the Pharaoh. My good character raised me high. I was summoned as one in whom no fault was found. If I were placed on the scales, I would come out complete, blameless, and without a blemish. I came and went with a firm heart, telling no lies to anyone. I know the God that dwells in man and woman. Knowing him, I knew this from that and performed the tasks as they were commanded. I never confused the message with the messenger. I did not speak vulgar words or talk with worthless people. Indeed, I was a model of kindness. My shit. See, the ancestors left us so many gifts. And, this, and all of this, every time we read something like this little book, it's a small percentage of what they wrote to us. Small percentage of that medu nefer, medu nefer when we speak it, that beautiful speech. And Paheri is, is, is almost like a spiritual brag. Like, I got swag. Like, I'm a noble. I served God one, and I was one skilled, and I like this last line, second part, free of negligence. Like, I was careful with my life. I was careful with the relationships I had. I was careful with the words I used, the thoughts I had, the food I ate, the morning rituals I had. He's a man who is saying to his uh, children's children who would read this after him, this is the standard by which you can live too. Because I'm just a human being. So you don't ever think that you're not the same as the great ones to who we pour libation. You're the same. You're made out of the same spiritual stuff. Man, the same DNA. Even the science is telling us that the DNA contains even the trauma of slavery. Mm -hmm. But it also must mean that it must also contain the greatness of ancestors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, we get caught up on the negative sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. and think, well, you know, post-traumatic slave disorder. But what about post-ancestral health disorder or order? You know, there's something good about us. We survive. We're still here. Every time something bad, we don't cuss folks out. We have a certain kind of comportment around ourselves. I saw a couple situations this week where people was tripping on other people, and that person didn't trip back. Ashe. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Ashe. You could have went off, but you didn't. Because you were skilled. You were free of negligence. It says, I walked the road I had explored. If you're exploring a spiritual path, it's one thing to chart it out. It's like if you get out your GPS. And you put in a destination, but then you never follow it. That's just knowledge. But if you take out your spiritual GPS and say, where I want to be is at the end in judgment, sitting in good faith, sitting without blame, you know, without any. The way he said, I, I am blameless without a blemish. If you want to be at that destination, you got to then walk the spiritual path. You can't just talk the spiritual path. You got to walk it. Yeah. Ashe? Yeah. Yeah. It says, I was one guided by my own heart. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say I was paying attention to what everybody else was doing, and I did that too. It's not what it said. It says, I was guided. Your heart is your compass, your gyroscope, your internal GPS to keep you on track. Follow your heart. That's what the ancestors always told us. Follow your heart. He says, I was, my good character raised me high. It didn't say the kind of chariot I had raised me high. The kind of house I lived in raised me high. The kind of fine clothes I had raised me high. It said, my good character, how I treated people, how I talked to folks, my reputation preceded me, and it was good. Some people's reputation preceded them, and it's not good. You know, when, they, when you see them coming, you go the other way. You hear about something they want to do, you say, nope, not, nope, not doing that, right? <laughs> what did you do with the day that God gave you? Yeah. How did you walk the road? Is your good character raising you high? Are the scales of judgment 
not tipping out of balance at the weighing of words. Because that's what they called it. They called it the weighing of words. Not word the way we think about it superficially, but word was thought. Word was speech. Word was action. They all combined that in that one set of, uh, at one idea. So the question is like, well, what, what is it that you have to do to get to the place that Pahari got to? Well, you have to live a life as if you're giving something back to God daily. Not waiting until some other time. Y'all know we put stuff off, right? We say, I'm going to do this Monday through Friday for me, and then I'm going to look at my garden and my yard on Saturday, and then I'm going to do God on Sunday. That's not how we roll. And African spiritual people, that's not how we do what we do. We want to seek knowledge daily. He says, I seek knowledge. I was summoned as one in whom no fault would be found. I came and went with a firm heart, telling no lies to anyone. Some of us think we're doing okay by not telling lies to other people. We're telling lies ourselves, though. We try, we're selling ourselves short, saying, I'm less than. I can't do this because of that reason. My self-esteem is low. Stop lying to yourself. If you're lying to yourself, you're lying to God. God made you perfect, and we start messing it up from birth. We start doing stuff that's not perfect. We start out pretty perfect. I say. So, you know, let's be honest with ourselves, honest with what we can do, honest with how we're going to seek knowledge daily. He says, I know the God that dwells in man and woman. I know the nature that dwells in man and woman. I know the prototype of Tehuti. I know the prototype of Aset. I know the prototype of Asar. I know the prototype of Shango, Yim and Yah. It's all just different names for the same thing. Ashe. He says, I know. He didn't say, I thought about, I wondered upon. He says, I know God that dwells inside my brothers and sisters. So if our daily practice is looking for how do we pull, how do we amplify, how do we have the God that resonates in each of our brothers and sisters be amplified? What are we doing to bring out the best in others? What are we doing to bring out the best in others? What did you do with the day that God gave you? It says no God distinguishing this from that. Now that sounds, that's some showing off black stuff right there. Like you want to distinguish this from that. And what, what this? What, what this? And what that? That's almost right in there with you know you know better. Yeah. Nobody got to tell on. you exactly what you know. When Bakari Awakoye gets to Howard University, there's going to be certain things you do and certain things that people expect from you. And if you get anything out of order, your parents hear about it, they're going to say something along the lines of, you know you know better. Ashe? Ashe. And we know you know a lot. Yeah. We're so proud of you, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are we, you leaving here like being held up because we are proud of you. Yes. How you have comported yourself the whole time I've known you. I've never seen you act it out. Now maybe you acted out sometime, but I didn't we didn't know about it. I should. <laughs> your parents love you, your grandmama loves you, your friends care about you. Every adult in this room sees you as one of ours. So when you go off, we know, we already know. You're going to make us proud. We already know. We already know. And when you do have a misstep or two, because we all do, you're going to have to come back to the, like, well, okay, what were they saying at, my, at what was it? Think, think before you act. Okay. Think before you speak. Tell her you got to study. That's a father advice. Like, that's the stuff your dad be saying to me, right? Like, I got to go study, baby. Yeah. Well, hopefully she be studying, too. We got to study together. We go to the library together. I said, we're going to come back to speak mine and do mine. Yeah. I had a beautiful thing happen this week. Shakuti Hodge, my old, second oldest child, sent me a, a, a text and he said, Dad, can you handwrite, think before you act, think before you speak, speak mine and do mine on a piece of paper and scan it and send it to me? I was like, that's kind of curious request. Yeah. Like, I said, okay, sure. Why? He said, because Dad, we used to do that all the time. We used to say that in the morning circle when we were growing up at the house. Stuff that we kind of forget about, right? But he didn't forget. He said, this is something I do daily. I think about this. And what I'm going to do, and this is the part I'm like, oh, OK. He's going to take it, like literally what I wrote, and take it to a tattoo artist. And he's going to have it tattooed on his body. 
like, okay, you take it, it's real serious. In my handwriting. In my handwriting. I'm glad I wrote it. I'm glad I wrote it up to Bobby High standards. It was neat. It was legible. Now, and I'm like, well, man, I'm gonna get blamed for this if it don't, if it don't turn out well. Right? But at least he didn't call and say he did thug life tattoo. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Although the acronym for Thug Life is kind of positive, actually. Yeah. We had, I forgot what it is. But still, though, you know I'm, I'm talking about it. ain't like, you know, big thug, you right. know, big, big. Yeah. yeah, it's not that. So, Wose, know that you have an impact on your children. Yes, Because he's one of yours, too. Yeah. He's one of yours. You know, I was at um, a group this week, and I talked about this at the, the night that, you know, they had the summer performance, which, by the way, was fantastic. Oh, wow. It was amazing. Those of you who missed it, you gotta see the film. Nimli Nopla, who is an amazing artist and teacher, came and worked for the kids with the kids for two weeks, as I understand it. And they came, and it was, you know, even correcting some of our gender balance stuff. Sometimes it's it's, it's in the tradition to see girls drum. So there were some girls drumming and some boys dancing. That's part of our tradition. You know, Mommy D. Cater, who's one of the best musicians, best historians of the music in the world from Guinea, he tells a story about how, how did it come to be that it was mostly men drumming. It, he's, what he told was like a long time ago, they used to put together festivals, and it was the women who always organized the festivals. Mm -hmm. And they would get the chora players, which is the string instruments, they would get the balafon players, they get people to come, and the women would arrange everything. They would arrange the food, they would arrange everything about it, and the way he tells the story, he said, and the men said, well, what can we do? And the, and the women said, well, y'all can drum. <laughs> that's what he said. That's, his, that's what the story and he's been handed down, right? But that program was just beautiful. Because it let us see that our children are capable of anything if it's well organized. Even the creativity of this got turned into a stage without using the altar. See, all these years we've been saying, well, don't use the altar. To, it was like, fine. They hung fabric from about this point in the room, and it was in the back behind the fabric was the backstage. It was amazing. Wow. How this room got transformed into a little theater, and they did a, a story about the monster who played drums or whatever. I don't know the name of it, but it was it was so with masquerade, full costumes, full out traditional costumes with raffia, with little hats. It was it was nice. Ashe at the pump up on that one. But on Wednesday, I was at a group called Determination. It's a group of brothers that had been getting together, young men with a mentor who are working through their own challenges. Many of them coming from families that are dysfunctional, coming out of community, coming out of thug life, coming out of all these things. And they, they started with a check-in. And a check-in is something, if you think about it, you can do that on a daily basis with yourself. Do a check-in with yourself. A check-in with God. And they started the circle by saying their name, and they were asked to, to say out loud the name of their grandfathers mm -hmm. and anything they knew about their grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And some of them had very positive stories to tell. They was like, my grandfather taught me how to fish. My grandfather taught me how to play chess. My grandfather gave me advice about this mm -hmm. or that. Mm -hmm. Ashe, yeah. a little bit of this yeah. or that. Yeah. Some of the grandfathers, they said, well, you know, he's a rolling stone. He had a whole bunch of women in his life, a whole bunch of kids. I, I got some cousins and stuff out here, uh, brothers out here. I don't even know who they are. But the point is, they, they did essentially a libation. And when they had finished going around, yeah. a young man named Ajman, he said, well, we should do this, we should have a libation all the time. Yeah. Every time we get together as a group, we should do libation. Mm -hmm. and that's a 21, 22-year-old brother saying this, mm -hmm. feeling like the need for that. And he said, because we did libations at Freedom Schools, where I worked this summer. Now, that made me feel good, because I'm, I'm one of the originators of Freedom Schools in Oakland. 21, two years ago, we started Freedom Schools. They're still going. Well, they hosted Freedom Schools a few summers ago. We're having an impact on our children. If we do something good daily, they remember. They might not tell you they remember. They remember. They know what's good. They know what makes sense for them. Then, second person said, yeah, that's right. We should, do, we should do this all the time because we should do this, we should pour libation all the time at Ile Omo Day. Oh. He's a former Ile Omo Day student okay. sitting in that circle, a little brother named Akio. We call him Kayvon. You call him Kayvon. Yeah. 
Kayvon. He still used the Kayvon. And the key said, well, sometimes they knew me as a kill, sometimes they Kayvon. But his sister, Asada's son. But the fact that our young men are out here, and we kind of look at them all in a certain way, thinking them negative and not this and not that, and some of them still, they got something in them based on what we put in them. Ashe, what did you do with the day that God gave you? Did you perform with the task that God put in front of you? Did you keep the message straight from the messenger? Did you not confuse the message with the messenger? A lot of times we can't hear truth because of who it's coming from. Ashe, we don't like the way they said it to us. We don't like how it happened, yeah, what the story they told, but sometimes it's, it's still truth up in it sometimes. So our ancestor, Pahari, was saying, I have never confused a message with the messenger. He says, I did not speak vulgar words or talk with worthless people. That's deep. That he didn't speak vulgar words. I have a model, I'm blessed. So I have a model of that in my own life. I lived my dad my whole life until going off to college. I went to Northwestern in 1978. I never heard my dad use one vulgar word. Oh, Ever. Mm. No profanity at all. Mm -hmm. Ever. Mm. Under any circumstance. He watched championship wrestling. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it's not really his sport. <laughs> but my dad, I, I mean, I, I reflect on it. Because wow. I know what pops out of my mouth sometimes is not the best right. language. Right. Right. You know? I never heard my dad call nobody a nigga. Mm -hmm. He didn't use that word. Right, right. Ever. Mm -hmm. He was a Negro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. He was, he, that's how they called themselves, with right. pride right. around him. Right? right? And I get the other side of that, too. Yeah. We have some folks with Negro-ish mindset that's not positive, right? Right, right? The point is, I never heard my dad use vulgar words. Sure. That's okay. a blessing, just okay. to know if that exists. Yeah. Right? And this text comes thousands of years ago. This brother is saying, I did not speak vulgar words. And I did not talk with worthless people. Mm -hmm. That one, I that's hard on that one. Ooh, like that's the serious judgment. Worthless. People must have really been doing some bad stuff to be considered worthless. Like you were just no good. And I don't need to speak to you. Now we may know some people like that. They go through worthless moments. I'm going to put it like that. Some of our crack addicted and drug addicted family members, when at last you done got tired of them taking everybody's stuff, and they done took everybody's car, and they done took the money out of mama's purse for the tenth time, and you know, at a certain point, you start feeling like worthless, and you don't really want to talk to them. Now, there is a certain compassion and forgiveness and all that, but they also got to be able to want to change. Just a little, a little glimpse of, I want to change. You know, did you do, what did you do with the day that God gave you? Ooh, there's a story I want to tell, and I didn't make it up. Once upon a time, there was this black bird sitting on the top of the tree, and she was beautiful. Black, silky, feathers, looked good. And she had found a piece of cheese on the ground, got it in her mouth, and flew up to the top of the tree to enjoy her cheese. Just before she started to eat the cheese, there was a little fox on the ground looking up, and the fox had a nice red silky coat, and, but that fox loved cheese. And he looked up and he said, oh, sister, sister Raven, you are so beautiful. Your feathers are smooth and silky and black. You look fabulous. And she started to nod her head, mm-hmm, had the cheese in her mouth, nodding her head. And he continued to compliment her and give her flattery. And he was good looking too. The fox was looking good. He's like, you know, we kind of look good together. I said. And he said, I know you look so good, but I bet you sing even better. And she was looking and thinking. She said, as she opened her mouth to sing, the cheese fell on the ground. And the fox ate the cheese up. So the moral of the story is, don't confuse the message with the message. Right. Sometimes people be telling you stuff, and she look good, people telling you stuff, and you get all caught up. You gotta know who you are. Love yourself, and on a daily, have a ritual that builds you up. Have a spiritual practice that is a daily contribution to eternity. Have a spiritual practice that takes you further than you were on today, so that tomorrow, you can say that you are a noble that you serve God, that you were one who was skilled and free of fault, 
that you walked the road of ma'at that you had explored, that you were guided by truth in your own heart, that your good character, your ma'at keru, your trueness of voice raised you high, that you were summoned as one in whom no fault was found. If you were placed on the scales, you would come out complete, blameless, and without a blemish, that you came and went on this earth with a firm heart, telling no lies to anyone, that you know the nature that dwells in your brothers and sisters, that you know, knowing God, you knew this from that, that you performed the task that you were commanded, that you never confused the message with the messenger, that you never spoke vulgar words or talked with worthless people. Indeed, you are a model of kindness. I say. Can y'all please stand if you would?
we didn't have time for announcements, but in final, I just want to say that um, I apologize for totally leaving out the affirmation this morning. <laughs> but the other thing I want to say is I want to encourage everybody to go to the Wolf website, check out the, uh, the no donation center, get your family and friends to go over there if you want to drive traffic to the center. And we've got some appreciation gifts there for them. So, I go. I go. I go. We have one other important announcement. Thank you. I almost forgot. Now, you everybody's attention just for a second. Now, everybody's attention just for a second. On Saturday, August 9th, at 6 o'clock here, from 6 to 8. We are partnering with the Museum of the African Diaspora on a program called I've Known Rivers Crossing Fences. It's a video storytelling project that Chael Timber Taylor, um, one of the great videographers in the Bay Area, has been um, doing. He did interviews with fathers and sons. Actually, uh, Kumi and I were our subject of this video. Uh, it's going to be a workshop with him and a brother named Gino um, Piper Ferreira, who is an amazing uh, actor, artist. But it's going to be looking at how do you take what we learn from those um, videos and turn it into art. And so everybody is welcome. It's a free event. We're co-sponsoring it. It's on the 9th, which is next Saturday. So 6 to 8 here. Um, if you want to see more information, go to MOAD's website. We've also posted it on our website. And uh, we're going to invite people to come to that. Cool. Thank you. We unraveled it and got it together. I didn't want to end on that note because the service was so beautiful. But uh, I had occasion uh, last week uh, to run into a, a member of Jose. Uh, she tells me she was the first member to join Jose. I know uh, people will remember Roberta Murdoch. Oh, yes. Yeah, I hadn't seen Roberta in over 20 years myself, and uh, it's just the way that we ran into each other was spirit. It was just totally spirit, because I had, I had almost just walked away and something told me to go up to her. And uh, I found out, I don't know if people know this, but I found out that her son, Damon, who we all love, he was so, such a beautiful young man growing up here, that he was uh, murdered. not sure what the materials to consist of because you weren't in class, just email me and I'd be happy to send you a list. You take that list, develop your clients, and when you're satisfied with it, call me or email me and I'd be happy to personally send you a list. So my point of view, so that anyone who wants that kind of assistance can have it. What I don't want to do is to take something that took me years you just hand it out to the candy and then it ends up on the shelf. The purpose of that demonstration was to get people started with the to the house. Yes. And that is still my objective. And I'd be happy to help you do it.
Yeah, so what did you do? Hi, you know, crap.